All right, in this video, we're going to be talking about molecular compound nomenclature, specifically the Zumdahl type 3 nomenclature. The Zumdahl type 3 nomenclature is for molecules. This is different than the type 1 and type 2, which were for ions. Molecules are formed when a nonmetal reacts with a nonmetal or a metalloid. So, no ions, therefore, no polyatomic ions. That is not part of type 3. So, the way you distinguish between the type 1, type 2, and type 3 is first ask yourself, is the first element a metal or a, the ammonium ion? If the answer is yes, it's either a type 1 or type 2. If the answer is no, then you have a type 3. So you have to ask yourself, every time you come across a compound, is the first element a metal or is it the ammonium ion? If that is the case, then it's either a type 1 or a type 2, and not a type 3. If the first element is a nonmetal and it's not the ammonium ion, then you have a type 3. Now the rules for determining the type 3 nomenclature are pretty simple. We name the first element as if it were a cation. In other words, we give it the element name, just like we did prior. We name the second element as if it were an anion, i.e., that gives us the root with the IDE suffix. Here's where we change it up a bit. We show the number of each atom type using Greek prefixes. So, let's talk about our Greek prefixes. These are the Greek prefixes. Most of you probably know these, even though you might not know you know them. So let's go through them. One is mono, two is di, three is tri, four is tetra, 5 is penta, 6 is hexa, 7 is hepta, 8 is octa, 9 is nona, and 10 is deca. And I say you know these because why is a hexagon a hexagon? It has 6 sides. Why is an octagon an octagon? It has 8 sides. Why is a triangle a triangle? Ah, uh, tricked you. It's because it has 3 angles. Triangle. So we're going to quick show you how to do the type 3 nomenclature just by a couple of compounds you already know. What is CO2? That's right, carbon dioxide. And then CO? Carbon monoxide. Okay, here's a couple of things. Number one, mono was never used for the first element. You notice we didn't call it monocarbon dioxide or monocarbon monoxide. So mono is only if we have the second element being a singular atom. And then you should also take away, notice this is monoxide, not monooxide. In English, we tend to slip vowels together. So this is what is known as an elision. So these two O's, a little smiley face there, elide into one O, so monoxide. So, for elisions, the ones you have to worry about is A and an O goes to O, and O and an O goes to O. Those are the only two elisions we're going to worry about. Okay, so let's do some formula to name. Here we have SO3, so we name the first element as if it were the cation, so we just give it the sulfur name. So sulfur, and then we have the oxygen, which gets the oxide. There are three of them, so what is the Greek prefix for three? Tri, so trioxide. Sulfur trioxide. The next one we have OF2, so oxygen gets named as the cation. So oxygen, and then we have the fluoride ion. Remember, spelling counts. Now, how many fluorides do I have? We've got two. The Greek prefix for two is di, so oxygen difluoride. Here we have P2O5. Phosphorus, we have two of those. So we're going to go ahead and write the prefix there, diphosphorus. So diphosphorus. And then we have five oxygens. The Greek prefix for five is penta. Now remember, AO becomes O, so pentaoxide actually becomes pentoxide, so diphosphorus, 
pentoxide. And then we have N2H4. We've got two nitrogens, so this is a dinitrogen. And then we've got four hydrogens. Now, this is the first time we've seen hydrogen as if it were an anion. So we take this and we add the I to E, so this is hydride. There are four of them, so this is tetrahydride. Dinitrogen tetrahydride. And then finally, IF7. We name the iodine, so iodine. And then we've got seven fluorines, so that is a hepta fluoride. Iodine hepta fluoride. All right, in this set, we're going to go from name to formula. Now, this is just as easy as going from formula to name because we're told what elements are present and how many there are. So, here we have sulfur dioxide. So, we've got an S and then oxide. So, we know there's the O and the di tells us there are two. So, SO2. Xenon tetrafluoride. Now, I know xenon is a noble gas, but the thing is, is us chemists, we're pretty persistent. We've gotten it to react with fluorine quite well. So xenon tetrafluoride actually is a real compound. So we know we've got the xenon, so we have an XE, and fluorine, it tells us we have four of those, so XEF4. Silicon dioxide, this is the first time we've thrown a metalloid in. The metalloid can be named in this type 3 compound, so silicon dioxide, so we've got an SI, and then dioxide tells me that I have two oxygens. And then finally, carbon tetrabromide. So we have carbon with bromine, and tetra means four, so CBr4. Now what about these two compounds, H2O and NH3? Would we name these dihydrogen monoxide and nitrogen trihydride? No. There are a few common names that are sticking as being our IUPAC or our perfectly correct names. Um, so H2O, still water. NH3 is ammonia. So those guys do not name with dihydrogen monoxide or nitrogen trihydride. That's not how we name them. We name them with our common names. So to sum up, the type 3 nomenclature is pretty simple but you need to make sure that you do not confuse type 1 and type 2 and type 3, especially when it comes to our polyatomics. CO3 2 minus is not carbon trioxide. That is the carbonate ion. So those two, no. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between your polyatomic anions and your type 3 compounds.